don't think of it as killing. I think of it as destroying evil or something. That's what you think of it as. From Doom to Grand Theft Auto. Doom was an absolute watershed moment, and violence is very much part of that game. And you go through and you blow away human beings and you blast them into bits. The irony about Grand Theft Auto is the juxtaposition. Wonderful game design, beautifully balanced gameplay. Layered on top of all that is the gratuitous violence. From Paducah, Kentucky to Columbine. They like started blowing up and shooting everyone in the cafeteria. So the two shooters walked up these steps of the school and then they saw my sister and uh, that's where my sister was killed. I think the connection is undeniable. The result of over 50 years of research and over a thousand studies prove pretty conclusively that children are affected by exposure to media violence. To try and extrapolate that doom caused these kids to go out there and commit these horrific crimes is pretty absurd. And it's a failure to look at the problems that we have in a larger media landscape. G4 presents the history of violence and gaming. Shame on people that produce that track. <laughs> violence in entertainment is nothing new. Violence exists in our society, and it's reflected in several uh, art forms. It's reflected in film, it's reflected in music, and it's reflected in games. But when it comes to violence in video games, people see things under a different light. Today, the game industry is under scrutiny. I think partly because it's interactive, partly because people feel like they're in control of this violence, partly because there have been a lot of lawsuits, most of them found not to have merit, that attacked the whole idea of acting out violence versus somebody who actually goes out and does something violently. And there have been some cases of individuals who played a game endlessly and then went out and did something evil. Others want government regulation of video games. Today's press conference will address the issue of video games and young people. What we want to do is to educate adults about uh, these uh, particular uh, ultra-violent video games, the harmful effects that they may have, the caution that one should take uh, in regard to giving it uh, to children. This is a public health issue. Uh, our society becoming more and more violent. I've seen the effects of violence. I, s I had two friends killed next to me. And I lost my sister. And to me, violence is its not a joke. It's not an art. There are people in the entertainment industry that make violence an art. And they make it a game. And they make it something that's toyed around with. But to me, it's not. To me, it's life and death. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. Meanwhile, the game industry and its supporters have their own views. We talk about this industry as if it's some sort of queer animal, queer duck. It's not part of mainstream entertainment. Video game is a, a baby right now in the entertainment industry, and some people want to pick on it. From the days of, of, of Pong, there was not really that sense that games were an art form. Games were originally associated with toys. Given the sophistication of game design, storytelling, the visual advancement in the technology of presenting games, they have really evolved over time to become much more closely linked to film. And film has gone through its share of trials and tribulations. I think a big part of the problem is that the public sees games as for kids and doesn't really understand yet that this is a viable medium for expression and for content delivery. Our average age of a gamer is 30 years old now. The typical gamer is over 18. The core demographic is 18 to 35. There are a lot of examples of violent art forms, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the art form is responsible for the violence. I mean, if you look at actual violence in the United States versus actual violence in, in a country like Japan and see that violent video games are actually on par in both nations, it becomes, you know, a little more clear that video games aren't the cause of the violence. It 
may look like there are easy ways to say, well, this is the cause of that. But if you dig a little deeper, it's, it's really not that simple. In order to understand today's situation better, we must look back at how it all began. From 1976 to 1982, a new form of entertainment takes over America. I was a video game junkie. I'm talking about Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, Centipede. Despite their primitive graphics, a few games managed to catch the attention of parents due to their violent themes. In 1976, Exidy's Death Race is one of the first games to gain such notoriety. The fact that you were running over people and then, like, you'd see tombstones on the screen. It was a representation of the death of innocence in its most simple pixelized form. That in itself is shocking to people. After facing heavy public outcry, Exidy pulls Death Race out of arcades. Over the next few years, games such as Splatterhouse, NARC, and Terminator 2 catch the interest of the media, parent groups, and other watchdogs. But this is just a prelude to the frenzy that comes when Midway releases Mortal Kombat in 1992. The first game that really wowed me with its gore was the original Mortal Kombat. I'll never forget seeing the character pull out the other character's spine and hold it up like a trophy. That was completely beautifully absurd for me, and I was hooked ever since that. The realistic graphics paired with the over-the-top violence of Mortal Kombat propel the game to an almost legendary status. It's interesting because they're pushing what they're doing in the game. They're getting a lot of PR, they're getting a lot of attention. That's clearly driving sales. This is how they're running their business. While Midway's bloody fighting game is taking over arcades, PC gamers are being introduced to id Software's first-person shooter, Wolfenstein 3D. Wolfenstein 3D changed the way that gamers expected to play because of the level of immersion that was suddenly presented by a first-person perspective. Games that to this point really hadn't looked anything like Wolfenstein. Gamers are impressed with Wolfenstein's first-person graphics, but others are appalled at the game's level of violence. Those same people are even more shocked one year later when id Software releases Doom. Many of the core dynamics of gameplay have often been representations of violence, right? Space invaders, you're shooting aliens, asteroids, you're blowing up, the little guy going across the screen. What you started to see in the early 90s was that the graphic fidelity got to the point where this violence could actually be represented in a much more realistic fashion. So instead of you know, shooting the space invader, now it's a Doom situation where you're seeing exploding body parts. Doom was an absolute watershed moment for everybody. You're a Marine going against the legions of hell, and you're actually fighting on the side of God, and you're dealing with these demons, and it's violence is very much part of that game. You get to run around and blow up aliens. Who doesn't want to do that? Both Mortal Kombat and Doom are groundbreaking, but the violent content found in both games will lead to a historic change in the world of video games. By 1994, video games are a hit both at arcades and in homes. And with the release of games like Mortal Kombat and Doom, they're becoming more graphic than ever. But when Mortal Kombat heads to home consoles, more parents begin to notice the violent content, and they don't like what they see. And I looked at it as a parent, and my wife and I talked, and we were saying, is this something we want in our home that we want to buy for our kids? Most of the time in games, the way you looked at your kids playing games and the way you looked at the business of designing and building and selling games was all really the same process, but there, the road divided at that moment. The controversy peaks in 1993, when the US Senate holds a hearing on violent video games. Leading the charge are Senator Joe Lieberman and Senator Herb Cole. And let me tell you this, we want you and not us. The two senators cite Mortal Kombat, Night Trap, and other games as leading offenders. <laughs> there was a growing concern about violence in some of the games. There were congressional hearings in the early 90s that took a serious look at the video game industry and wanted to make sure that the video game industry was acting responsibly, not just in terms of properly labeling the product, but in terms of marketing its product. 
The hearings lead to a simple ultimatum. I hope you walk away with one thought today, that if you don't do something about it, we will. Establish a video game rating system within one year or face federal regulation. The game industry response is swift. The Entertainment Software Association was launched in 1994, and it grew out of two converging trends. One was a growing concern, particularly in the political community, about violence in video games, with the release of the first Mortal Kombat, a game called My Trap, and some other titles. And the second thing was kind of a recognition within the industry that it was really becoming a big part of the entertainment industry and needed to grow up and mature in terms of how it presented itself, both to the public policy community, but as well to the media. The ESA in turn establishes the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, or the ESRB. Once the ratings system was created and the ESRB was created, and you had a T rating, or you had even an M rating, now it was a situation where you look at it in a different way because now it's what audience do I want to reach? What kinds of tools do I want to use to reach that audience? It's not a government mandated uh, system. It's a voluntary system to assess the content of games and provide parents with the ability to accurately gauge what it is they're buying for their children, which is a lot more detailed. The amount of specification in those rating systems is a lot more detailed than some other parallel industries bring to bear. For a time, it seems that all is well. One of the things we're most proud of is the rating system really has been a leader in providing good information for consumers to understand what's in the game. When we set up the system, we set it up not just to provide information on age appropriateness of the game, but also what's the content that drove the rating. So each game has an age descriptor, an age symbol on the front of the box. And on the back of the box, it repeats the age symbol and also has a box that says, here's the kind of content that influenced the ratings. I think the ESRB has done a lot of good. It's becoming more effective every year. A parent, particularly, and other consumers can pick it up and say, oh, this game is rated teen for mild violence and strong language, or it's rated M because it has intense violence and blood and gore or a sexual theme. And so it's very simple, very easy for a parent to quickly understand this is what's in the game, is it appropriate for my child? The formation of the ESRB doesn't stop public outcry against all violent games. There are still a handful of titles that manage to get watchdog groups up in arms. Armageddon was basically an okay game that got a lot of press and a lot of attention because it had the violent element. Phantasmagoria was the schlockiest, cheesiest game I've ever played. I believe Phantasmagoria actually had like a scene of marital rape in it, in which this creepy dude with long hair like took his wife against her will and whatnot. And it just totally looked like it was like lifetime movie, but even like worse. I remember Phantasmagoria because CompUSA would not sell that game when it originally came out. They banned it from its stores. And the reason was because of its violence and because of the nudity in the game, which had full motion video of the heroine topless. And at the time, well, even today, that would be very controversial stuff. In a few short years, the debate over violence in games will flare up again hotter than ever after a series of horrific and unimaginable events. On December 1st, 1997, 14-year-old Michael Carneal walks into his Paducah, Kentucky school with a handgun. He opens fire on a group of students in the middle of a prayer meeting. When the smoke clears, three students are dead, five are wounded. As parents, teachers, and law officials sort through the aftermath, they learn that Carneal is an avid gamer. The parents of three victims in the Paducah shooting file a lawsuit against the entertainment industry, claiming that violent media drove Michael Carneal to kill. Their lawsuit accuses 25 companies of negligence. On this list are Polygram Film Entertainment, New Line Cinema, Atari, Nintendo, Sega, and others. Whenever a tragedy occurs, we want to look for a scapegoat. We want to look for something that is the easy way to explain what's happened, because what's happened is very, very upsetting. Everybody finds a medium that they feel is influencing the children, and they like to point the finger at it and believe that it's the cause of society's ills. Just a few months later, on March 24, 1998, tragedy strikes again. 
In Jonesboro, Arkansas, an 11-year-old boy and his 13-year-old friend bring a small arsenal to their school and ambush their classmates. I heard a bunch of shots and people were falling. There's the bullet that came about that close from hitting me. Four children and one teacher are killed. Ten others are wounded. Uh, this was the, the stairs that the two shooters first went up uh, before they entered the school. But one year later, the worst tragedy of them all occurs in Littleton, Colorado, at Columbine High School. On April 20th, 1999, I went to the school library to do some homework, and I heard shots coming from outside of the school. At first, I thought it was a senior prank. I thought maybe there was some paintball guns or some, some fireworks, until a teacher ran in screaming that there were two students outside the school with guns and that they were shooting other students. The teacher yelled at all of us to get underneath tables. That morning, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, both Columbine High students, embark on a shooting rampage that horrifies the nation. Then we heard the gunshots inside of the school, and they were coming closer and closer to the library. That's where the library was. That's where I was. It was the scene of the most intense shooting. The library was the first room that the two shooters entered, and immediately they were shooting off their guns. They were having conversations with some students before they shot or killed them. Ten students were, were dead or dying, and over 20 were wounded in a matter of less than 15 minutes. The nightmare ends when Klebold and Harris turn their guns on themselves. Among the slain are Columbine teacher Dave Saunders and Craig Scott's sister, Rachel. So the two shooters walked up these steps of the school, and then they saw my sister, who was back in this area. Immediately, I felt like there's something wasn't right with my sister, Rachel. I called my mom. It was one of the first things that I did, and I said, Mom, I'm OK, but I think there's something wrong with Rachel. And I had not heard anything about her. And it wasn't until the next morning that we found out that she was the first one that was killed. The tragedy at Columbine is the worst school shooting in US history. In its aftermath, accusations and blame are spread far and wide. The media repeatedly points out that Klebold and Harris were both fans of violent video games, especially Doom, which by now is six years old. I know that the, the video games that the two shooters at Columbine played affected them. Maybe it wasn't the biggest factor that made them go and kill people, which I don't think it was. But I think it was something, an influence that they chose in their life that did affect them. They played extremely violent video games. I believe, no doubt to me, that it, af it affects people. The first person perspective is a very powerful and very interesting way to depict a game. And when you start depicting these kinds of acts in that perspective, it scares people. Those kids, they may have been playing video games. You know, a lot of kids do. But that was not the problem. You know, their local culture, the way they were alienated at school, these were the problems. Their access to guns, their access to the materials they had, these are the problems. Irresponsible parents that aren't even watching them, these are the problems. Once again, a lawsuit is filed. Families of Columbine victims sue a series of media companies, including 11 video game publishers and developers, such as Sony Computer Entertainment America, id Software, and Activision. They seek $5 billion in punitive damages. Meanwhile, America searches for answers. All the names of the victims on this plaque. In the aftermath of Columbine, there is a flurry of accusations against violence in the media, and more specifically, video games. The outcry leads to endless debates over the effect violent games have on children. I've seen the effects of two kids who were surrounded by violence with what they chose through video games and other things. I saw them kill other people. They say Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris played Doom, played Quake. I'll tell you what, millions and millions of people in this country, many of them under the age of 25, have played those games. Rather than seeing an epidemic of carnage and violence in this country, between the years of 1993 and 1996, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the arrests for juvenile violent crimes were actually down precipitously. Now, I don't have to mention that this was at a time when the sales of violent video games were at unprecedented levels. If we look at Columbine, we go, where were the parents while the kids were building an arsenal? 
Instead, they want to go after Doom. To try and extrapolate, Doom caused these kids to go out there and commit these horrific crimes is pretty absurd. And it's a failure to look at the problems that we have in a larger media landscape. I think the connection is undeniable. The result of over 50 years of research and over a 1,000 studies prove pretty conclusively that children are affected by exposure to media violence. What's funny is it, no one ever bothers to go into the details of the studies that allegedly link video game violence to actual real-world violence. Now, how they're affected varies from child to child. It's also dependent on a lot of external factors, like what kind of home environment they grow up in. But even if a child doesn't grow up uh, to become a, a you know, a cold-blooded killer, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be affected by exposure to media violence. First of all, they're never talking about real-world violence, but real-world aggression. And the way they usually define that is, is stuff that would make you laugh. They talk about eight-year-olds who are more likely to shove each other playing real games if they've been playing violent video games. They never tell you about kids play rough. When they actually get hurt, they know that someone is hurt and the game ends. That's a part of child psychology that is never addressed in studies like this. A new field of research is looking at how the brain reacts when they're exposed to media violence. The research is showing the brain's perception of media violence is exactly the same as the brain's perception of real life violence. They talk about aggression. Let me tell you what, seven-year-old boys, they're aggressive, whether they play games or not. But I do think that games are part of a culture of violence contribute to it, but I don't necessarily think there's proof that they cause it. Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, who runs a, an organization called Killology. He likes to credit himself with creating an entire brand of scientific study, which he calls, ridiculously enough, Killology. And they talk about the fact that they use these same sorts of first-person shooter video games to train soldiers and help soldiers overcome their sort of natural aversion to killing other human beings. So the same sort of psychology is at play in a lot of video games. The boy who opened fire on his classmates in Paducah, they said, uh, had never held a gun before in his life, but he played a lot of first-person shooter video games. And so he learned how to aim with deadly accuracy from playing these video games. In 1999, David Grossman, a former U.S. Army Ranger, writes a book titled, Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. He argues that violent media, especially video games, can lead to violent behavior. David Grossman is a pseudoscientist, and that's being kind. And many of the video games give bonus effects for headshots. He loves to talk about how murder simulators, which is his code for video games, with any kind of violence in them. He's talking about how the army is using the very same video games that we're playing for fun to train people to get over their instinct against killing. It's just not true. That's completely wrong. It's completely false. If you spend any five minutes with Grossman's theories, you can begin destroying them immediately. In 2000, a joint statement endorsed by the American Medical Association and other groups is released at the Congressional Public Health Summit. Violent entertainment is a public health hazard. It says that well over 1,000 studies point overwhelmingly to a causal connection between media violence and aggressive behavior in children. What does that teach our children? However, these studies are contradicted by the U.S. Surgeon General. In the year 2000, the Surgeon General of the United States of America reviewed all the available literature, all the available studies on the impact of media in general, not just video games, on real-world rates of violence. And he concluded that he could find absolutely no link between one and the other. In 2000, the Paducah lawsuit against various game and media companies is dismissed. In 2002, the Columbine lawsuit is also dismissed. The debate over violence in games is nowhere near over. These ultra-violent video games teach children how to kill, how to maim, how to destroy individuals. The game is a massive success and becomes the best-selling title of the year. But while gamers are singing its praises, others pay attention to the game for entirely different reasons. Well, Grand Theft Auto 1 and Grand Theft Auto 2 were pretty straightforward action games, top down, you chase around the cops, you play the bad guy. But with Grand Theft Auto 3, it sort of revolutionized the game. The irony about Grand Theft Auto as a franchise is the juxtaposition. Wonderful game design, 
beautifully balanced gameplay. Layered on top of all of that is the gratuitous violence, the sense of violence without consequence, which I think so many people home in on, or the idea of maybe you can escape the consequences of your actions. Where you really got in trouble was you were able to use hookers to raise your health level. You take a hooker, go into an alley and have sex, and you see the car rocking. And then if you wanted to afterwards, you could run the hooker over and get your money back. That really set off a lot of the uh, opponents of the industry. Grand Theft Auto Vice City comes out in 2003. The game receives even more praise than its predecessor and comes under just as much criticism. I think it's gone too far with video games, with games like Grand Theft Auto, where kids are beating up cops, pimping prostitutes, and, and hitting girls. And I guess my question is to the people that are making that, is it worth it? Is what you're doing worth it? And the thing that's interesting and important to note is you can play Grand Theft Auto and not be a terribly violent person. You can steal an ambulance and go take people to the hospital. You can steal a fire truck and put out fires, technically doing good things. We call it sandbox gameplay because it's literally you can do whatever you want. As with many of the violent games that came before it, Vice City is blamed for another tragic incident of real-world violence. There's the case in, in Alabama with this boy who repeatedly played the game Grand Theft Auto, and then he killed two police officers. And it's a big deal in the media right now because the parents are suing Sony because they feel like this game helped lead to this boy shooting. The shooter's name is Devin Thompson. After his capture, he reportedly says, life is a video game. You've got to die sometime. It's just amazing to me that a criminal can make one utterance like life is a video game, you've got to die sometime. And now an entire industry has got to be hauled in front of Congress. It's so absurd. Again, and this really can't be stressed enough, there are millions and millions and millions of people gaming in this country. And many of them are adults playing violent games. And what you have seen over the last decade is a precipitous decline in actual youth violence, rates and arrests of youth for violent crimes. The most important thing that we should be saying is that game affected him. It was one of the pieces, one of the puzzle pieces into him killing two people, two officers. Vice City also gets in trouble over what is seen as racist content. What happened was your character was working with a Cuban street gang who was at war with a Haitian street gang. Now, there was a historical context for this. In the 80s, in Miami, the Cubans and the Haitians didn't get along. So it made sense in the context of the game, because the game was set in the 80s in a city very much like Miami. I hate these Haitians. They messed with me for the last time. The problem was the vast majority of the people who got upset about it didn't know that historical context. They saw a screenshot with a guy standing there and it said, kill all the Haitians. This stinking nest of Haitians, we gonna kill them all! It's a real deal. Die! They sort of interpreted that as a call to genocide, which would be horrifying. That's not what it was, but that's what it got interpreted as. After numerous protests, Rockstar has the offending lines of dialogue removed from future releases of Vice City. Take the Haitian heads down! In 2005, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signs AB 1793, a bill that requires video game retailers to post signs informing consumers of the ESRB video game rating system. The man behind this bill is San Francisco Assemblyman Leland Yee, and he's just getting started. After successfully getting California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to sign AB 1793, San Francisco Assemblyman Leland Yee pushes for a new bill known as AB 450. We looked at, at current law. Currently, there's laws that protect children from, they call it harmful matter, and what's in there is pornography, obscenity. There's nothing in there about violence. This issue was brought to me by one of my staff who saw some of these uh, 
violent video games and she was rather taken back by how violent uh, these activities were. And so we started to look at how we, in fact, could handle this issue. AV 450 is going back to the original concept, which is making it a civil offense. It won't be a crime. You can't go to jail for it, but it'll be a civil fine if someone were to sell ultra-violent video games to anyone under the age of 17. Well, you know, it's a feel-good it's a feel good piece of legislation because the first thing you do is you pass the legislation. The next thing you do is you try to enforce it. It would be very difficult to enforce, but more importantly, it would require another layer of government and a lot of expense because just like alcohol and, and tobacco, you'd have to have inspectors. Just don't shoot me, officer. The violence has to be criminal in nature, really directed towards the Grand Theft Auto type series. So what's the real purpose? To pass a law so he can go home and say he stopped something? Or to pass a law knowing that it's going to cost millions of dollars to enforce and that voluntary regulation is, for the most part, working quite well? AB 450 is voted out in June 2005. But Yee doesn't give up. After amending AB 450 into AB 1179, he makes another push to get his bill passed and succeeds. On October 7, 2005, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signs AB 1179. What this bill will do is to give parents some power over the purchase of these uh, games. Uh, it will no longer allow their children to go to the store and purchase these games. The biggest issue the game industry has with Yee's bill is that it treats video games differently than other media, such as film or music. Opponents to the bill also say that is unconstitutional. Um, to Assemblymember Yee, why is the state not targeting movies and other forms of media, such as books, you know, TV shows? It's because these ultra-violent video games, these first-person, third-person shooters, where when you push a button on the computer, then you are literally shooting, <laughs> killing, burning, maiming individuals. It is those kinds of games that we are talking about. There is an argument made by a handful of critics they're arguing that the verisimilitude of the video game experience, the reality of it, the graphics, the sound, that it's actually a, a different medium than books and music in the sense that it is more damaging, is the word they would probably use, to a young person. And there is a plethora of studies that demonstrate that there are harmful effects to children. There's really not a, not a lick of, of honest scientific evidence that the play experience of a game is causing any kind of physiological change. For as long as the debate over violence in gaming has existed, people on both sides have been arguing in circles. We want you, and not us, to develop a voluntary rating system. In total, there are probably four or 5,000 titles in the marketplace today, and there are 50,000 retail outlets. For us to try and go back and rate those products, sticker all those products, it, it's virtually impossible. But make no mistake about it, we will move ahead if you do not. But very few of these people have actually had violence affect their lives. That's not the case for game journalist Dean Takahashi, the author of Opening the Xbox. In, uh, in 1993, I, I lost my brother to violence. Um, there was a, a case of mistaken identity uh, when some gang members were looking for someone else that they wanted to, to kill. They uh, went up to a house, they knocked on the door, they shot the guy who opened it. Uh, they knocked on the wrong, wrong house uh, door, and uh, they shot my brother. And he died almost instantly. After losing his brother, Tracy, in a tragic shooting, Dean has developed a unique view on virtual violence. I re remember saying um, in a letter to the judge as he was sentencing the guys that they caught uh, who did this, uh, that life is not like a video game. We need to kill people. To shoot them, the bodies just don't magically disappear. On the one hand, uh, it is possible to distinguish in your head between fantasy and reality. I can still play games and not think about my brother. Do all of these, these things in a fantasy world and realize that there's nothing happening of consequence in the real world because of them. And yet, I also am disturbed enough by that thin line that I watch what I play. I 
try to be a sensitized consumer of games. There are certain games that I won't play. To what degree are you desensitizing people? Is it harmful? Is it not harmful? How harmful is it? There's different degrees because you can have a game like 007 where you're shooting spies and you're on a mission. But then you can have a game like Grand Theft Auto where you're just living off the street beating up random people, shooting cops, you know, killing prostitutes. I don't like playing the bad guys. When I play the games, I want to be the hero. Basically, I want to wipe out anybody causing the kind of pain that people cause to my brother. When you think about it that way, uh, I have a, a kind of an ethic on whether I will play games where the only thing you can do is play the bad guy. I think game developers should be aware of this kind of distinction and that it matters. The choices that they make and the kind of games they create do have consequences in the real world. You're on a Today, the game industry is under more scrutiny than ever. Lawyers such as Jack Thompson are calling for violent games to be pulled off store shelves. And I and others are prepared to take legal action not to allow the release of this game because it constitutes a clear and present danger to the safety of our children. You are the great. And politicians like Leland Yee seek more government regulation. In 2005, the American Psychological Association published its findings, which pointed to a link between violent games and violent behavior. You're incredible. You should get paid for this. Uh. Meanwhile, recent controversies such as the hot coffee mod for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas have led to attacks on the integrity of the ESRB. I never understood the phrase meaningless sex. The signage uh, helps, uh, but it really doesn't stem the problem. It doesn't stem the tie of children purchasing these particular games, nor does it stem the tie of other individuals going into these video game stores and purchasing it for children. If, in fact, these games are not to be sold to children and it's not for children, then why is the advertising dollar directed towards children? The single biggest misconception about the video game industry and violent games is that the industry is actively marketing violent games to kids. But the Federal Trade Commission specifically singled out the games industry ahead of movies and ahead of music as the industry that was going to the greatest lengths to keep violent content out of the hands of kids. I think most people in the industry would agree that young children should not be playing these hyper-violent games. And that's why the ESRB system is in place. Certain games are made for children, certain games are made for adults, and it's up to the consumers to be able to use the ratings effectively and figure out which is which. See, you gotta play the game that's right for you. A mature rated game is not for kids. These games cost $50. Little Johnny can't save up that much lunch money. And we know for a fact it's parents who are buying these games for their kids and then complain to their politicians about the content. It's an education problem. They have to learn what an M rating means. The debate over violence in games is nowhere near over. But there is one thing that people on both sides can agree on. There are no easy answers. I believe that everybody is responsible for the product that they make. They can't take responsibility for how it's going to affect somebody. I cannot blame people that made the violent movies and video games and music that Eric and Dylan listened to. I can't blame them directly for Columbine. The blame lies with the two shooters. But I would say to those people, look, you influenced these guys. You affected them. They chose your media, and it had an impact on them. It's the same as the responsibility that um, filmmakers have and television producers have. If they know that children are going to be accessing their product, then they need to seriously consider the potential consequences of unleashing this sort of graphic violence on kids. They're tasteless games, just like they're tasteless movies and tasteless books. I once had a debate on the radio with a woman who said to me with a straight face, games should be curtailed, not books, no matter what the content of the book. And I asked her, does that include American Psycho? Do you think you know kids should walk into Barnes & Noble and be able to buy a copy of American Psycho filled with pornographic descriptions of women being killed? 
Uh, and she said, well, yeah. I mean, that's literature. That's a book. And this was just completely absurd to me that people are not fundamentally getting the hypocrisy inherent in singling out games for this kind of treatment. I don't think you're going to see the industry stopping creating violent content, whether that means eating a little ghost in Pac-Man or blowing up mutants. These sort of core elements of violence are appealing to people in the same way that they are in television and movies and in other mediums as well. So I don't think it's going to go away. We're all here trying to make life a little bit better, a society a little kinder and a little softer. And to that extent, selling these ultra-violent video games sets the stage for a generation of other individuals that are desensitized to violence, that are desensitized to defaming and dehumanizing individuals. We all have a responsibility to do something about that. If you were to try to artificially change the standards for gaming, it would simply move offshore you'd end up with an industry leaving the United States and working somewhere else to no benefit, because ultimately, we're not going to be a successful Puritan enclave. There's a bright silver lining to the debate right now about violence in games and politics, and that is that the country is aging and the country is gaming. And at a certain point, us 20 and 30 year olds who are gamers for life, we're gonna be the people in positions of power. We're gonna be the politicians. We're gonna be the Leland Yees of tomorrow. We're gonna get it. We're not gonna have these knee-jerk reactions based on totally unscientific arguments. So over the long haul, demographics are gonna answer the problem. Over the long haul, all the adults and all the voters and all the politicians in this country are going to be people who played games as kids. Every time there's a new form of entertainment, that's what a lot of people look towards. The comic book industry went through this in its early stages. The movie industry went through this for a while, and it's just video games' turn right now. These games reward you for one thing and one thing only how to kill, how to maim, how to destroy individuals. It is a sick, disgusting video game, in my judgment. The criticism has got just no basis in, in sense or fairness or fact. These are people who don't know anything about video games. Most of this stuff is so unreal, how could you ever be influenced by it? They contribute to the violence in our society. They're teaching our children that murder and mayhem is fun. It's just a game. I mean, we're not going to do this in our backyard. If someone's going to go shoot people in real life, they probably have other problems going on. There are those in the entertainment industry who say that the studies are inconclusive, that there's no proof of harm. Well, we don't understand a lot of this stuff yet. And as much as science would like to claim that it virtually knows it all, we still have a long ways to go. So members of the video game industry, do you have the power to elevate or denigrate our society and our children? I think as we see in the years to come, as games become a more normal part of American society, I think a lot of these fears will really subside.